Good morning, everyone. Those of you joining us um, in person and on the YouTube channel. Uh, today, Bob's lesson is going to be on Jonah, chapter 4, verses 5 through 11. Um, I'm going to be reading out of Jonah, chapter 4, verse 6 through 9. <clears throat> and it says, Now the Lord God appointed a plan and made it come up over Jonah that it might be shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant, but the dawn came up the next day. God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And when he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. So if you see up there, there's a plant, and that supposedly is the pumpkin plant, and it grows really fast, and this is my prop, my little pumpkin right here. So uh, I'd like to introduce you with a story of a famous, probably the most famous athlete of the 19th century, I guess 19th, is Jim Thorpe. You may have heard of him. He was an Olympic athlete. In 1912, Jim Thorpe's family's anger over his 1912 gold medal being stripped away from him is understandable. In Jim's day, many college athletes earned extra money, um, about $25 a day playing minor league baseball. They used an alias to keep their amateur status. Jim's mistake is when Jim played baseball in North Carolina, he signed his name. The American Olympic Committee used this proof to strip Thorpe of his medals. Well, when you think about the anger over receiving something beautiful, then only to have it stripped away is understandable. From anyone, the anger involved in that is understandable. And that same principle holds true in today's story with Jonah. Just remember, here's the principle, to receive mercy, only to have it rescinded, is something that anyone would understand their emotional response in anger. Amen? Amen. And that's the lesson that God needs to teach Jonah today, and maybe us too. So, last week I ended my sermon is, wait a second, didn't Bob, didn't you say Jonah's reaction to Nineveh being spared is an overreaction? Yes, because that was the first question in verse 4. God saved Nineveh because they repented, right? And Jonah was so angry in verse 4, he says he wished he would die, and God asked him, hey, don't overreact. Is it right for you to be angry? That's verse 4. But then Jonah does what one commentator stated, and it made me chuckle, is maybe what some of us do when we get angry. The silent treatment. You get that? A commentator said that. The silent treatment. Here's Jonah's silent treatment. That's the picture of it. Here's what he did. I'm going to put it in bullet point fashion. This is verse 5. It's loaded, verse 5. Jonah's silent treatment. First of all, in 5a, Jonah decided, he didn't even talk, he just went out. He went out to the edge of the city. That's the first thing he did. 5b says Jonah sat. He sat by the edge of the city and looked at that picture. He's looking at the city to do what? To see if God would actually overturn the city, and that's what he was hoping for. So he sat, he went out. He even built a shelter with his own hands. And then he waited. He waited to see in verse 5 what God would do. Hoping that what? The city would be overturned. Now here's where God steps in. This is why I introduced the lesson with Jim Thorpe. To receive mercy, only to rescind it, is something that not even God would do. And Jim Thorpe's gold medal being rescinded or being taken away, stripped, anyone emotionally would respond in anger. Amen? Amen. Well, this is the lesson of the gourd vine. If really think about it. So here it is. Verse 5, God steps in to teach Jonah a lesson about God's scandalous mercy. 
that he would not be willing to rescind mercy to Nineveh. God won't do that. And Jonah needed to learn that lesson. So if what God does in verse 6, and I believe I put another slide to represent that. Oh, I'll leave this up for a little bit. God provided a plant, right? Supposedly, it's a, it's a pumpkin plant. This is why I put my plant. Pumpkins grow really fast. I don't know if you know that. I don't know anything about that, but they have big leaves. And it says, God provided a plant. This is verse 6. A leafy plant and made it grow over Jonah to give him shade for his head to ease him of his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. So when you think about that, what is God trying to teach him with just that little growing of a plant overnight really quick? It's representing God's mercy. The plant represents that God's willing to take care of you and he's willing to provide and do the little extra things to comfort you. Amen. Don't we all need that? And that's what he teaches Jonah. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But then God had to teach him the other lesson about justice. And that's where the worm gets involved. In verse 7. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm. And notice in how I'm wording it. <laughs> Who provided the plant? God did. In Hebrew, it says God appointed a plant. Just like he appointed the fish in chapter 2 to swallow Jonah for three days and three nights. God did that. God appointed the plant. God appointed a worm in verse 7. At dawn, the next day, God provided, it says in English, but in Hebrew, it's appointed a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. And then interesting, that's a symbol of divine justice. So you've got divine mercy. You have a plant that grows up overnight and gives you shade and makes Jonah feel good, and he's happy about it. And then the next day, he provides a worm that chews it, and it withers. And you can see Jonah's starting to get boiling with anger, but God wanted to teach him a lesson to make sure he understood the point of justice, that God's gifts are irrevocable. Amen? And here's what he did in verse 8. When the sun rose, God provided. Interesting. We all like to receive God's mercy, but do we like to receive God's justice? And that's a lesson that Jonah needed to be taught, right? Because the bigger lesson is the Ninevites. God provided a worm. Verse 8. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. One more time, when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And the word for faint is very similar to the word in chapter 2, verse 7, when my life was ebbing away in the belly of the fish. He was, he was to the point of almost wanting to die or dying. And he was angry. So the plant is a symbol of of God's divine mercy. Two, the worm is also a, the first symbol of God's divine justice. And three, the second symbol of divine justice is the scorching east wind. And the reason why I wanted to bring that up to you is because the lesson of the gourd vine, and I thought this, I, for some reason, this popped in my mind. This is the movie Nacho Libre. When he's angry, about what the church does with him as being a luchador at night, sneaking and going out and wrestling, which was illegal, I guess, for the Catholics to do in that day, but he was making money for the orphans. So he went and did what Jonah did. He sat on the hill over there, made his little shelter, and was, I guess, complaining to God. Sulking. Sulking. So what's at stake here is this. God provided this leafy plant and this worm and the scorching east wind to help him understand this point. Jonah's anger about receiving God's mercy only to have it stripped away is understandable. Jonah now understands that because God provided a plant. It was God's mercy. He gives it to him and then oh, it takes it away overnight. It's the same thing would happen to Jim Thorpe. It's understandable for anyone to be angry. And here's the point. Because of that little illustration, Jonah is now in a position to sympathize with Adonai, or God's decision, not to rescind his mercy to Nineveh. 
Does that make sense? God extended mercy to Nineveh. Should he take it back? Just because Jonah's upset about his enemies receiving it? Absolutely not. And that's the lesson that God has to teach Jonah through the plant. I wanted to be very clear about that. I hope it is clear, as clear as mud. <laughs> but uh, So here's the question now. Now the question is revisited, but this time the question is understandable and Jonah understands it. The first question is, do you have the right to be angry about Nineveh? And he's angry and God's saying, hey, don't be so angry. But this time it's understandable because God's going to turn it around and say, well, what about the Ninevites? So verse 9, here's where we pick up. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? That's the same question he asked in verse 4, but he adds two or three more words about the plant. And it's understandable for Jonah to be angry, right? Because it, God provided it, it gave him comfort, and then he took it away. And so Jonah agrees. And think about God. He is wise in the way he tricks us into a siding with him and Jonah not even knowing it. It is. I am so angry, I wish I were dead. So the symbol of God's mercy is also the symbol of divine justice. And this is where the story gets good. This is where God steps in again. Remember, the plant is the symbol of God's mercy. But the object of God's mercy are people. And look at that. And it makes me want to cry to think about that. Just look at that. Aren't humans more valuable than vines? Shouldn't I be concerned about Nineveh? That great city. The text itself reads, but the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. God's justice and mercy, or mercy and justice. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000, and I love this in Hebrew, sons of Adam, Adam, daughters of Eve, who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many behemoths, animals, beasts, that shows the comprehensiveness of God's grace, that he cares for people, and he also cares for animals. The righteous care for the needs of their animals. It says that in Proverbs 2.10. And the pagans, the Ninevites, were keen to pick that up. And God was keen to write that in the book of Jonah. And that's how the book ends. So I'd like to unpack it. It's just three little takeaways. And come back to that story of Jim Thorpe. To offer God's mercy... Only to have it taken away is something God is not willing to do. Neither should we. Amen? I put, it's something we, that we must not be willing to do. Especially during Christmas season. Especially during Thanksgiving time. Jesus is the reason for the season. And shouldn't we be a light on a hill in this dark world? People, I became a Christian on December 29th, 1982, walking in a little church very similar to this at the age of 22, and they gave me a chance to accept the gospel. Amen? Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind as we come to this time of the year, that there are people out there that we don't know that are waiting to see the light that's not shut down. Nineveh's deliverance was an act of divine mercy really motivated by God's scandalous divine mercy and love. Amen? He even loves the Ninevites. I was reading the article about Jim Thorpe yesterday because it reminded me of to receive mercy. It's understandable of his family and probably Jim himself to receive a gold medal only to have it stripped away 
is understandable. But in 19, wait, in 2022 on July 15th, Jim Thorpe was restored not only as the gold medal, but as the only, the sole winner of the 1912 Olympic gold medals that he earned. At first, they, re, they tried to, the first time they restored it, they said, well, he's a co-winner. He's a winner with the other ones. But they finally, his family and his grandkids, and this is 99 years later, they restored it to full, complete, that he deserved it. Amen. And I thought, that's a message of the gospel. Amen? Let today be where you are reinstated as the son of Adam, daughter of Eve, that you were meant to be in the first place. Amen? That you and I were meant to be. Let today be that day. His holy angels in heaven and his witnesses on earth, you're sitting among a group of witnesses on earth, are waiting. Amen? Amen. And praying for you to soften your heart and come to Jesus. As we stand to sing a song of invitation, it's number what? Forty-seven. Please stand as we sing song number forty-seven.